Okay, the topic that I'm handling, my, uh, the talk today is an opinionated fight on Reddit. So I just step in. I think first of all, I guess I could start by introducing myself. You get to know me before we move on. So I'm a software engineer. I've been in the industry professionally for now over six years. My tech stack is Python and JavaScript. If you want to get into the details or the weeds of it, I prefer Django on the Python side of things. Uh, and I'll talk about an, an other toolkits that I have uh, as far as Python goes. JavaScript, I'm a fan of Vue.js. I'm also a technical writer. I've been uh, writing for over three years now. That spans from tutorials to also being professionally engaged to write technical uh, documentation, API documentation. And uh, that's my web profile, uh, md.engineer. I was surprised there's, an, there's a tld.engineer. So feel free to look up there. And then last but not least, I, I am involved in three main communities of programs. The first one is GitHub Star. I'm currently the only Kenyan in that East Kenya who is living in Kenya. There's so many other Kenyans out there. <laughs> wait, so, wait. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's one. And uh, uh, I've nominated a number of us so that it can be a, a good number. Secondly, I'm part of the Circle CI Technical Writers Program. What that is is that uh, we have engineers or techies like yourself who can write articles. Mostly border, uh, uh, yeah, bordering the CICD side of things because this is Circle CI. And guess what? You get paid per article. Uh, and because this information is public and out here, uh, per post, I believe currently it's going at $350. So if you want to start and be a, a, a writer within that program, feel free to speak to me. And then lastly, I'm also. Um, a visionary in the tech techlink community. This is a community that's been there for now over ten years. It's progressive. We the I could highlight two things. One thing is that we usually hold a techie quiz every week. For those who are uh, connected to us, you definitely get the the link. But uh, feel free to go to t e c h k l n dot o r g. So what what do we expect from this talk? We I'm, I'll be talking about tools that I use, and I'm hoping that you'll open also open up to tell me tools that you use, practices and resources that uh, I I also use. We might have a, a limited hand hands-on coding, even right now because of a technical hitch. That's not my machine, so but uh, because. We are all Patanistas here, I'm sure I can do something. And then last but not least, I'm not going to talk about one thing that fixes all. Definitely there isn't uh, a Swiss army knife for that. So, let's start. What does opinionated mean? Opinionated means that, uh, you can read there, but generally it's, it's talking about having a firm uh, opinion, oh no, having a firm uh, view or judgment concerning something. So right now in this talk, I'll be talking about my toolkit. And feel free to bash it. Feel free to say that's not the best. There are so many things that are now out here, and that's the reason for this con this uh, talk. Secondly, Python. We all know. Uh, I call it the simple yet satisfying programming language. And fun fact. Uh, let's see, yes, a question rather, instead of me dispensing with. How many years is Python now? 30? Are you sure? You are close, but not, not exact. Any others? Hmm. Okay. Okay, it's 31. Wait, wait. Yes, so it just turned 30. That was uh, 
uh, February last year. So now it's 31. And because of that, uh, I happen to have a number, oh, a number of stickers here for GitHub, so I'll be distributing them. We have one already, or two. I just place them here. As we go on. So, and then lastly, what's a toolkit? We all know that tools make work easier, right? Yep. So a toolkit is just a container of tools. And that's what we are going to be talking about. So a bit of a segue here, I enjoy doing DIY. I'm a DIY fan. And particularly team are not metal. So here we, on my on your on your left, we have what I call the essentials. For, uh, for any timber work. That's a uh, circular saw. We have the tape measure, how many nails, and we have the drill. But we have the extra there, that's a jigsaw, and that's a router. In other words, what I'm saying here is that with this pipe, if you count the nails, uh, you can basically do like 80%, let's call it the 80 20 rule. So you can basically do 80% of most of DIY timber related, but the, less, but the, but the rest is surplus. So I'm um, bringing this up because that's also the angle we are going to be talking about in terms of tools. Uh, definitely there are those that are essentials, but there are those that are surplus. And moreover, you can start with a circular saw as a power tool, but we know that we start with a manual saw, right? So if you start there, then you can definitely proceed. So as far, that was uh, DIY. As far as tools go, before I get to specifically Python, uh, these are what I can call toolkits that are out there. So we have dot files. Are we conversant with dot files? Anyone, at least? One, two? All right, I guess, I guess I'll, I'll need to show, show us that. Uh, but basically, these are scripts, or they are the files that have a dot in the beginning, like dot btg. No, that's a dot file. Make sense? Yep. Yes. Uh, so uh, basically, when you talk about uh, dot files generally, we're talking about scripts that you can use maybe to start up your own machine. Mm. If, uh, for those who log in to or SSH into terminals, you might have a thing or two or several commands that you want to be using every time. So if you have your dot files, you just spin it up, and there you go. Secondly, I think we are all familiar with templates. Uh, we have a number of templates even for React and uh, Vue and the, the like, where you just have a, uh, it's, yeah, you have a startup pack. And enough, uh, yeah, back then when I was doing hackathons, I'm, I'm really, I've, I've missed hackathons. So but back then when we were doing hackathons, just anticipating for a hackathon, you create startup packs. And by the time you're getting to the hackathon and you kind of figure out which solution you're going to be providing, uh, within one hour you have most of the things going on, so it's just a matter of moving on with the specific tools. Then uh, I consider programming languages as tools, and I think we agree, right? Yep. Uh, are they tools that make or give you a solution? Yep. Like uh, you, you, you have a solution, you're deciding which tool works best for you. Are you going to use Python? Are you going to use JavaScript? Are you going to use a particular framework? And uh, last but not least, we have libraries, and those are definitely opinionated. Uh, yeah, tools that you can use, uh, specifically because they are written by some people or some companies and out there for you to use. So you might notice there, tinker, break, build, repeat, I think a number of times if you, if someone is looking through tools, they're going to start by tinkering through a number of tools. Probably look, uh, use the ones that you are meeting in the team that you are that you're joining. And then you could break it, or it could break itself, then eventually you get to build or get someone who's built another one and that's the, pro that's the loop. So if you want to follow this, because moving on, there are a number of uh, tools that I mentioned, and uh, through that link, you can see 
much more detail of the tools themselves uh, like uh, directly redirecting you to the websites or a number of them is also uh, my individual repos that uh, could color or give more context to that particular tool. Are we clear? Yep. So far so good? Yes. Awesome. So now this is where we dive in and I'll break it down into four workflows. The development workflow, review, testing, and deployment. So let's start. Development workflow. When you're setting up your machine, you've got your new machine. When you're setting up, I'm sure we, we definitely need to consider which platforms we are using. Are we using Windows? Are we using Mac OS? Are we using Linux, right? So uh, Python specifically is installed within, I think, most of these OSs. But the, the versions that are there are just so that the operating system runs. So it could be, it may not be really uh, work for you. So that's where you could upgrade or definitely, or just uh, wipe the whole thing and decide that you don't need that particular area or uh, that particular area that that programming language is being used, in this case Python. Uh, secondly, we have version control. I think we are conversant with that. Uh, the most popular version control right now is Git, right? Yeah. And then IDE, the greater development uh, environment. You could just use a text editor. Um, how many still use, is it text edit? Vim. Vim, okay. Sublime text. Vim, 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 Sublime text. Sublime text, okay. Well, I'm a fan of VS Code. Yes, VS so Code. That's my list over there. So I can definitely shift. Let's look at how time is running. I'll definitely shift to how different ways you can install Python versions, multiple Python versions, virtual environments, and Docker. And uh, so I think, no, I believe the local setup in this case is the one that's most relevant now for us. So if I can just shoot here, okay. So for the Windows users, we have Chocolaty. How many have used Chocolaty? None, okay. For the Mac and uh, Linux users? Brew, Brew Stop. right? Yes. Or how do we install Python? Sorry? Up to the up to get. You just use up to get. Works. It definitely works. I don't know if you can see that. Let me just. Okay. Uh, yes. So, moving on. In terms of virtual environments, there is a link there called uh, from Real Python. If you want to look at that. But, uh, we have these three as the main ones. Pip in Pip N, virtual N, virtual N wrapper. How uh, is there anyone who doesn't use any of these three? Okay, which one do you use? Miniconda, I see. Okay. Uh, nice. maybe we could figure out uh, who uses Pip N here. None. Alright. Virtual N. Okay. Virtual N wrapper. Huh. Okay, all right. There are a number of benefits that virtual and wrapper has over the rest. Uh, if you can just follow with me. So this is pip and you just install it, pip, uh, pip install, and you install the package, and pip shell, that's how you get into the virtual environment. But in the case of virtual and wrapper, it's just a wrapper on top of virtual end. But what it does is that you can quickly get into a virtual environment by you create using main uh, virtual yeah. m then type work on and it just gets into that environment to deactivate you just type deactivate so it's pretty similar to what we have in virtual m but instead of this one where you write source and not only name deactivate at least right now you just write work, work on, on. Yeah. all right 
Um, yeah, uh, there is also the process of using Docker. Docker, in this case, will be, you, you are definitely isolating not just a Python environment, but you are isolating a whole operating system environment. So if there are cases that that helps, that's when you now switch on to uh, Docker, for example. All right, so the next, still on, right, uh, okay. Yes, still on development workflow. We are switching gears to prototyping. And this, in, in this case, a simple way of saying this is just getting into your Python shell. How do you get into a Python shell? It's just Python and then presenter, right? Yeah. Are there better ways of doing it? Sorry? Just IPython, nice. Uh huh. Who else? Well, I've used IPython. Maybe you can try BPython. BPython is an interesting one for me. Uh, and then, in terms of dependencies, we've talked about pip install, right? And for that, we use requirements.txt, right? Uh, we used pip file, pip lock. Anyone? Whatever, and then yeah. after you're ready to deploy, write to comments. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you do it. Yeah, okay, okay, interesting. <laughs> okay, and that uh, probably you do pip freeze. Oh, yeah, to see whatever Yes, and then uh, that when you, you, you pipe it to recurrent replaces. All right, so we also have, uh, I believe it's pip and that. Uh, you can you have a pip lock just the same way in, in JavaScript we have package JSON the block is it right okay yes and uh, we also have a pip file so uh, pip n in itself uh, suggests that there are, there are a number of upgrades or benefits that that has but I still settle with the requirements of the TXT. Then last yes. So we can also use Replit if you are conversant with that. Let's see. Yep. Probably a number of us already use this. Let's see. But Replit Replit uh, you can just start a Python uh, shell environment install whatever you need and then just uh, run it. So in this case I just ran import this. We all know that, right? The then of Python. And uh, this is the B Python I was talking about. So specifically for you, you can look at uh, the benefits. Let's see. So it does give you the uh, reference, autocomplete itself, and a uh, number of other things, inline syntax, ILG. The one that I really like is, uh, I think IPython also does this, and that is the uh, auto indentation. Yep. I think that using IPython, right? Okay. Yes. Yes, so BPython is also uh, uh, an, uh, an option for you. In terms of reference, yeah, because I have them out here. Yeah, yeah you mentioned Conda, there you go. So in terms of reference, I'd like to bring us to a, uh, bring us, bring attention to this. I don't know how many of us have used devdocs.io. Anyone? All right, so devdocs.io uh, is a PWA, Progressive Web App. So what that means is that it's a website that you can basically install even on your phone. And the beauty about it is that you can download, it's, it's a reference material, you can download specific culture, specific uh, reference, like in this case by default we have CSS, HTML, but if I ask you to try Python, yeah. Uh, maybe yes, please, and enable that. Uh, it should install, and I'll just go ahead and install the app locally. 
So that's that's what you get. You get uh, your reference over there. Let me just set this. Okay. Yes. So in term, uh, for example, if you are searching a particular documentation and it's saved locally, you can just type uh, "py" for Python tab, and then specifically maybe string. You want to look out here into the docs for string. So just type that, and it goes into everything. And the beauty about this is that you don't need to go into the like Python docs. You just have it there. It's local. And just look at the number of tools that uh, that you that is at your disposal, including Python. Uh, all this backbone behind the rest. You might even Docker. It's 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 a it's a hit list. Sorry. Yeah, you can have Django, you can have Flask, you can have, uh, let's see, I don't know which other ones are here, let me see, Flask, Flask is there, which one do you have in mind? Pyden. Sorry? Oh, EECK, seems not to be there, yeah, but I have a solution for you, so uh, that's the next thing we are, we are going to do here. So. Uh, I've talked about PyDocs and it just helps you have rapid development reference and it's offline and you have keyboard shortcuts which make it easier. Uh -huh. so on the shell, yes. if you write, if it's a library, like if it's, I had a problem, actually I need, I need to check something, look up something on the random library, uh -huh. the, so it's random slash r, it will it, yeah. automatically, on the shell it will yes. automatically give you, give you all the partners. So that's so that's the hard mode. <laughs> okay, <yeah. laughs> so it's offline and I did that on the shell. That's, that, that's the advancement. <laughs> yes, it makes that's sense. The hard totally makes sense. So uh, the other one here is uh, using wget. I think we, uh, we know that, that this command just uh, downloads, right? So in this case, we, are we can use this to mirror an entire site. So in your case, this is PyDev, right? So we can definitely, is it this one? It's that one, okay. So in the mid, oh, okay, yeah, I can do that. While we are continuing with the presentation, we'll download this and come back to it. So it's that you can see how it works offline, right? Okay, so let me just do that real quick. I'm just uh, copying this. terminal and uh, what you do is that you just uh, add the link here and then okay you don't have that we get okay I was expecting a bit of a lag, so I also dropped my internet. Choker. Um, yep. I think you've all seen that, right? Let's see. Perfect. So, we will install. So we just have that, download the site, and we have our offline documentation. So you can basically do that for your own, for the number of uh, sites or packages that you use. Okay. So while that's going on, I'll continue. Okay, so we'll get back to that. Uh, the rest, as I, uh, for all, all of you who scan, you can definitely follow. The links are there, and for those who haven't, I'll share the link just uh, at the end of the talk. 
Uh, so we have the Python docs. Uh, the tutorial itself is a good one. Uh, if you follow uh, Python, uh, you, you'll, you'll get to hear that this was a big pain point for beginners to use Python. So uh, the maintainers of Python decided to put a lot of work into the tutorial. So if you look at the tutorial, if you haven't looked at it uh, recently, it's really, it's, it's much better right now. So Real Python is another resource uh, I can suggest. There's this guy called Greg Cannon, he's a Canadian, I believe, and I think right now he's probably over, he's been maybe over 10 years or so writing uh, C Python, being part of the uh, committers of, yeah, those who commit on the C Python. So he has a blog that could, you could find useful. And last but not least, there's also python-guide.org as far as resources go. So far, so good? Yep. Any questions? All right. Oh, yes, let's just confirm that WGate is there. Yep. And uh, we can download that site. OK, let's see. Yep, so that will continue as we go. As we go. Yes, so the next step, still on development workflow, is linking, formatting, and uh, I've just put a category there, miscellaneous. So another question. So far, I think we have three people who participated. And as I've mentioned, there are several speakers here from GitHub. So what's the difference between linting and formatting? You know? What's the difference? Uh -huh. Oh, wait, you, you participated. Let's hear it. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, you, uh, anyone with a different opinion? Okay. You want to? Yes. Okay. So how I like to look at it is that linting uh, highlights errors. So it's not opinion per se, it's actually that there's an error there. You, you've written it in a different way, it should be written in a specific way. But formatting, OK, here I mean not syntax per se, but I'm talking about maybe, yeah, you misquoted it. It was a function that you called it in a different way, something like that. That's where linking comes out. But formatting is what you're talking about. Tabs, spaces, and the like. You seem to have a different opinion. Yes, sure. I think you said opinion because I don't know if it works the same way as I do. Uh -huh. so the Android link checker, yes. what you mostly co correct you on yes. is typos on your variable. <laughs> your typos uh -huh. and variable names. Yes. So that's, that's, and that's right. Yeah, if yeah, it's variable names, it doesn't help as long as. I consistently call it the way I define it. Okay. <laughs> okay. But, uh, Fair enough. But what what gives you the squiggly lines in a in an editor? Is it the formatter or, a, or the editor? It is the editor. So it does. That's at least it's important to differentiate the two. But uh, now back to you. Probably there are a number of tools that are both formatters and linkers. Yes. Yeah. So that's probably where that's yes, coming from. So yeah, so we are clear on the linters and formatters and what that is. So my list is placate for the linting. Uh, and formatting. Uh, do we use editor config? Anyone use editor config? So man. All right. Okay, interesting. Okay, black for Python. Okay. Uh, I sort. Okay, anyone else? Interesting. Uh, and I don't think my upgrade should be there. My upgrade should be in the miscellaneous. But yeah, there it is. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a different one. So yes, that should be in the miscellaneous. So maybe I could just quickly go through what editor config is. And uh, for reference, I believe, 
Yeah, we have them here. Yeah, I've just not added the editor config in that list. So quickly, let's see what editor config is. And hopefully this is uh, beneficial to all of us. So editor config uh, is a dot file as you know, this is dot editor config. But generally it uh, maintains consistency across files. Uh, and this could be team uh, across your, yeah, this is definitely across a repo. You can put it across an, a whole organization. If you're keen on everyone in your team maintaining that. So what it does is that uh, you can just copy this. Uh, yes, the whole, that whole file. And then paste it in uh, dot, dot editor config. I, I think right now, uh, by now, I have put that as, a, as always a check in my development workflow. But uh, it, now we all know something else when I open this up. Um, is that editor config runs in so many editors. So for these editors, you don't need to do anything. If you just have a dot editor config, it will configure your files. And for these add-ons, you need to install Upcode and Atom. I, I believe Sublime Text, someone mentioned Sublime Text over there. Yeah, and the name. Is it okay? Yeah, uh, and also VS Code. So for VS Code, it's, I think because I'm using VS Code here, you can just look at it. And config. Yep, there you go. Yeah, it's installed. And uh, a simple way of looking at this, I don't know if we have it here, but I'll just quickly get, still using that we get, and show you a quick way of doing this. So this is my GitHub repo, I'm just looking out. I have a template, we've talked about templates before, right? Yeah. So I have a repo boiler template, it has most of the things, and this is my preferred editor config. So what I do here, um, okay, yep, there you go. So I'll just use cal and get into my terminal, maybe here, and uh, turn that. So that sets the editor config there and the simple a simple one that we have over here is wait, wait a moment. can you see that Let's see. yeah you can see that right okay so a simple one is for example if you are keen on the format of your end of line to be a specific one. There you go. You can just set that up. If you're keen on the final line being an empty line, just set that to true. And the number of things are trailing, white space, uh, indent, and all that. So if I was to get a repo here and I've just added that editor config, VS code by default, now that I've also installed editor config uh, extension, it will just format most of the files to meet this standard. And you can see even indentation, in my view, I, I like, uh, a Python definitely is advocated to have four indent spaces, but a number of JavaScript uh, developers maintain indentation to be two spaces, but this is my preference. So yeah, that's about editor config. Uh, maybe for the rest, uh, I mentioned we have them here, we have the links here. I saw black. What black does is that it gives you a consistent uh, style guide for your repos. And for most of the, for most part, it's not configurable. So a number of people just decide this is the way we are writing Python. And if you install black, uh, especially for a project that maybe has, has been there for a while, Almost every file will have been changed. The letter is just running black. So it's a big one. It's, it's, 
is, as I mentioned, opinionated. Isotic is a good one. And still, this is maintaining consistency across your, uh, across your repos. What ISOT does is that it sorts and groups imports. So uh, have you ever been in a situation, mostly for big files, that you're not sure where maybe OS was imported? So you're not sure if it's, you want it written, import OS, for example. But ISOT ensures that all imports are, the, are at the top of the file. And then secondly, uh, there is a there's a particular order. Uh, let me see if I can get it here. Well, I'm not saying it. But generally I think we start with uh let me start with hmm. please remind me what's the order? I know it's alphabetic, but the other order. Yes. Then the third party turn up the local. Okay. Then then? There's a, there's a special rule to it when it comes to OS and uh, two letters, three letters. Yes. Oh, so it starts with the two letters and then two, three letters. Okay. So, yeah. Go on, go on. <laughs> Next participation. Yeah, so there's, there's the import part, then in all categories, then the strong, what do you call it? Then? Yes. Okay. Even if they are from the standard library, yes. let's say you have to import OS, import and then you can do now under that from data import matches the type B. Yes. So it's a problem. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks for sharing. So there you have it. That's ISOS. And then which was the last one? Yeah, we've talked about the fire create. That should be a bit different. So just, I don't know, I can't tell it here. But yes, that should be in a different side. Okay. I, I believe Pi upgrade, similar to Django upgrade, what these two tools do is that they upgrade your, your code to meet the most recent syntax, uh, Python syntax, or for Django, Django syntax. So you might have written it in a different way, but uh, right now things have changed, so it, it makes sense for you not to just go line by line and it is, you just use a uh, uh, fire, fire grid. So far so good? Yep. Okay, awesome. So while we are going to the next one, the miscellaneous, feel free to look at all of them. So we'll be shifting gears to documentation next. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so, okay, the guy is no longer here, but we downloaded uh, documentation for, yeah, this is PyDeck. PyDeck. Yes, PyDeck. So to, to be able to run that, I'll simply use HTTP, the server, that's the inbuilt uh, Python server, so you don't need to install anything in case you ever want to have a server. And then maybe I can specify the port. Hmm. What's happening? Okay. It's Python 2, that's right. Uh -huh. Yep, there you go. Okay. Ah. Yes, there we go. So this is the the one that we downloaded. And you can because you've already linked everything, you can just go to by install, you can do all that. You basically have the whole documentation yeah. on the machine. Nice. So it's really helpful. At least uh, I've seen it. Uh, I've used it uh, a number of times for a number of things. Well, so I was talking about switching gears to documentation. And definitely the first place to start is uh, readme. But while I do that, I'll see 
That's it. I think I should just be generous with all of them. Yeah, this is a lot. Yeah, so these are commercial breaks. If you have any questions, feel free. Can you talk about all you talk? Yeah, sure. So I think everyone can get three. Yes. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> well, uh, so documentation. So, so you can do three and the bottom and the left. Okay, there seems to be a lot. I'm on documentation. Okay, yes, read me. So, definitely before we go to having maybe publishing your package on the docs or something like that, the best place to start in terms of documentation is the read me, right? Yep. So, what are the things you do in the read me, apart from this is how you start? What, are, what other things can you do in the read me? Uh-huh. Examples, okay. So you, uh-huh. Good. Yeah, I think that, that helps a lot, uh-huh. Yes. Aha, aha. Okay. I think also the requirements for TST can come in handy. We are talking about that, but definitely we are talking about the Python. Or the, uh, yes, Django will be a yeah. Django will be a requirement. It will be a yeah. But it will be a dependency rather. But in case of Python, in the case of Python, you are specifying which Python that you use. Okay. What else? Aha. Uh -huh. Report bugs. Report what? How to report bugs. How to report bugs. Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. So you're now getting into, uh, that is open source maintenance, actually, right? Oh, but it helps uh, because you, you might also have an internal, uh, an internal tool and you're specifying this is how you report bugs. Well, okay, moving on. License. Which, which license are we used in our project? MIT, are they, are they, are they, excuse me, are they, are they in Cuba? Are they speakers? Oh, okay. I think we might have two per person though. Oh, no, no, I still have more. Oh. Yes, yes. So let's maintain that. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, well, uh, yes, we are talking about which licenses we use in our projects. MIT, I take the easiest one. Which other one? Sorry? Copy left. Sorry? Copy left. Copy left. Left, left, left. Copy left. Copy left. left yeah. hmm. it's, it's I'm not so sure how to write. Oh, it's now copy left. Yeah, ah, interesting. Okay, so there's copy left. I will not have that. Uh -huh. Any other? Yes, JNU. Yes, JNU. Uh -huh. Which other? Which other? Oh, this is Apache 2.0, I believe. Uh -huh. Okay. So, if you want to, whenever you're thinking about that, you can just go to choose a license that form and then figure out which license makes sense for you. So, and they try to make it as easy or comprehensive as possible. Like, uh, I want, I need to work in a community and there's all that. If you want more, it now breaks it down more specifically. So the, the GNU, we've talked about that. I think most of the time, I look at the limitations. It just the it, it helps to just go through that. So warranty, this license explicitly says that it does not or provide any warranty. So yeah, you've been warned. And then you have like Mozilla over there, Apache, um, MIT Boost, the unlicensed, and this is not just all all of them. There there, there are also a number of them. Uh, like one particular one that I created recently. 
or used recently, rather. Okay, a moment. So we all understand that extensions, you can just use it as you want, right? If I create uh, an extension of VS Code, I don't really care what people use it for. So there is an interesting one here. Okay. Just taking maybe, maybe Python extension. Let's see, you to the change log. Log details. Is there any way to get this? Okay. Let's see. At what space? Okay, I seem not to be able to get it yet. Yeah, you know. Okay, please. Yes. Uh, and then license. Here we go. Yes. I, I don't know if you've come across this license. So yes, that's also a license, apparently. So there, there are quite a number, and you can come up with one yourself, should you, should you want to. So moving on, uh, as far as documentation generators, here we are talking about not just writing markdown on the readme, but you have maybe uh, annotations in your code and those are used to generate documentation. So a good example here is Sphinx. A number of uh, packages that we are conversant with, especially those that are published on read, read the docs.org, a number of them use Sphinx. Licensing we've talked about, but maybe I can delve a bit deeper into markdown. Uh, into, yes, to markdown, best practices, and values. So as far as markdown goes, probably most of us know how to use markdown, but there are a number of things that we might find a bit weird or not quite sure how to maybe, like one that I've, I've, I've come across pretty recently is being able to have two lines in one cell in a table using Markdown. But I would ad advise you to look at Microsoft Docs for Markdown. The reference is pretty awesome. And also GitHub. And then this might also come in handy if, if you use Markdown a lot. I, I have an extension. For those who are using VS Code, you can use this Markdown extension pack. It's just a pack of, uh, I believe, six or five packages, or no, extensions rather, that uh, can be really helpful. So let's see. Yep. And then I also wanted to highlight badges. I don't know how many of us are conversant with badges on README or README badges. Yeah, right? A number of us? Okay. For those who may not know what this is or what badges are, yes, these are examples of badges. So, yeah, this is a badge, this is a badge, this is a badge, all these are badges. Basically, they help you just uh, by looking at a repo, you can know significant info about it. Like in this case, this is Linux. Uh, the and it has 1.2 and that's maybe really not thousand downloads per month. No commits per month rather. Uh, this is a package that I have. Uh, yeah, this is a repo I maintain. Just has 519. So badges can be. I've highlighted here a number of badges and categorize them for your use. So if, if you have. If you're publishing packages, you can use these installs. Uh, yeah, and there are quite a number of them that are general, like just version. Uh, something particular, I think one of us said in terms of saying or specifying which Django Python is in a particular or is works for a particular repo, you can just basically have these Django versions and specify that these are the versions that you can use. So there might be a question of how do I create that? The sim 
let's say, in the new set. Mm. So just quickly get that. Yes, for badges, the easiest way to get to them is shields.io. Shields.io. And these are, these are very fast way of doing it. So you can specify that you want a certain GitHub repo and uh, if you want Ansible and the like, so you just copy that and add that there. I think, I believe they have a number of, yes, they have a number of uh, examples. Well, so moving on, we are now from, we have now moved from documentation within the development, the development workflow to review. And this begs the question, how do we review our work? I guess we all review our work first as the solo person if you're looking at your code, right? Interpret the Chelsea. So you just run and it's reviewed. Okay, makes sense. You can also have it online, so you can have specific, um, maybe, not linking. Oh, yes, using this is awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah, so you can also run it online, maybe having it within a pipeline, a CICD pipeline, continuous integration. And also within a project management tool, you can set up that these are the acceptance criteria for a particular feature. Mm -hmm. So you, here are my top. Uh, I use GitHub desktop a lot. A uh, number of people say this is this is Lazy. the beginner way of using it, but I prefer it because unfortunately uh, I don't think the owner of this yes the owner of this market does not have a GitHub desktop. But uh, if you are on the terminal and you just type GitHub dot, uh, I think the CLI is really powerful. And then if you are a visual person, GitHub desktop could help you a lot. And much recently there is a feature that. If you still use this, if you use, if you're comfortable on the on the terminal, uh, I think this could be could make you or render you not so much advanced, and that is being able to cherry pick cherry pick commits. So right now within GitHub Desktop, you just pick two and drag, and that's how you cherry pick a commit nice. instead of the whole command. There are several commands to do that. So in terms of IDE, I've mentioned that VS Code is my go-to. And there's also pre-commit. Pre-commit uh, basically is a package that integrates with a pre-commit hook. So you can put in linters. So before you commit a particular, particular change, a linter runs and gives you feedback. As far as online goes, uh, the GitHub pull requests and the GitLab uh, merge requests can become really useful, especially if you have uh, a number. Yeah, you can add a number of tools. Like for example, uh, for a number of main uh, open source maintainers, before code is accepted, you need to have signed that your employer has confirmed that that code will not. Be, it would be rendered as company property, if that makes sense. So there are a number of tools that help in that. And uh, for GitLab, if you're a GitLab uh, user, uh, I'm really surprised why they call it merge request. But yes, it makes sense, merge request, pull request. Uh, which one do you prefer, merge request or pull request? Pull request. Merge. No, uh, that doesn't uh, merge request make sense. I'm requesting to match this stage. Exactly. And the other way is that I am requesting that you pull this stage. So it's basically who is the action here uh, for those who are uh, keen on the English. So as far as project management goes, uh, how many of us have used Shortcut? You know, shortcut.com? You know? Oh, interesting. You mean yeah. Clubhouse? Sorry? Previous Clubhouse. Yes, previously it was called Clubhouse. But not the Clubhouse as uh, iPhone app. Oh. Yes. In the, actually, Clubhouse iPhone app came after this, and because of the popularity, Shortcut had to change 
Mm. So that's something interesting. But basically what shortcut uh, is, is that it's an issue tracker. It's equivalent of using Jira if you're conversant with Jira Trend. or GitHub projects if you use GitHub projects. Yeah, so this is how it looks like. Uh, it's pretty intuitive when once you get uh, the hang of it. Yes, and uh, that is uh, as far as the review goes. So we have still a few slides to go, and I can see that uh, my time is almost up. That's five minutes to go. So as far as testing goes, definitely unit tests. Uh, the the legal unit tests is that uh, yeah, a number of people use unit tests. It makes sense. Sorry. Uh huh. You just like okay. Uh, yes. The whole idea of pre-commit is, uh, pre is to maintain the discipline. That's the idea. So I hear you in terms of uh, it might slow the work, but uh, uh, let's let's not bash it on the on the tool. I think we, if if your team has used to commit, the idea would be probably talk to the team and discuss that we need to remove the commit or give a suggestion that on Fridays, let's not have big computers. <laughs> so, let's go. Oh, yeah, so, uh -huh. I think, uh, as well as, I think the confusion comes in. Yes. That whole argument comes to a part of it. Yes. Yes. GitHub is where you collaborate. Yes. GitHub is where my code is going to affect you. Uh -huh. And uh, this thing. But locally on my machine, before I push it on like this, it's, it's yours. Your, Yes. So, so which one do you suggest? Which one do you suggest? I, uh, I prefer a pre-push. Pre-push? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes. Or even to push and do check something. CI check. Ah. Call it check. Yes, yes. So you just have it on GitHub, for example. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. You have a control your opinion? Yes. Uh -huh. Which other ones have we come across? There is also Semaphore CI, if anyone has used that before. Travis. 
Sorry? Travis. Yes, GitLab pipelines, right? Mm. And there is also a no. Bitbucket pipelines and GitLab CI. Mm. Sorry? Yes. And then GitLab CI, yes. Mm. So uh, all all this depend on uh, how complex or advanced someone somebody is. But my preference if anyone is beginning and they just want to use a, a CI tool. I would recommend Semaphore CI. Semaphore CI is really straightforward. You, you're not writing config files and everything. You're just writing as uh, this showed here. You're just going to go into Semaphore CI, uh, link the repo, and then just type the commands as though you're typing it locally. So it becomes really quick. And uh, I believe they also create a config file for you. Uh, Circle CI has come up with a a new way of doing this, just to make the barrier of entry uh, smaller or shorter, yes. So, towards the end, we are now shifting to deployment. Yes, and deployment in this case, there are two ways of deploying in my view. So there is having your instance uh, deployed somewhere. We have the likes of ngrog, which is locally, uh, Heroku, you can use Docker for a number of setups like a digital ocean. I think also, not I think, I, uh, I'm, I'm sure also, um, yeah, Google Cloud as well. So there's a repo I've also shared on the link concerning different ways. I think I go through seven options of deployment with pros and cons. This was once. I just put it on writing, but if this was once shared in a talk, in a PyCon talk in 2017. So I just added my my preference. So we have NGROG and the rest. So feel free to dig in on that. And then as far as publishing goes, you can definitely publish within your uh, version control environment or the version e tool of choice. And that is using tagging, or you can use PyPy to set up PyPy, uh, yeah, so that you can publish on the Python package index, so that somebody can now install, pip install the particular package. Uh, yes, let's see. There is a tutorial I've written still within that concerning publishing a Python package with the help of Circle CI, so feel free to also look into that. It just goes into the depths, especially this one file, the setup.py, uh, and all that classifiers and all that. Yeah, so that could be helpful. And then, yes. Now this is the second last one, and basically we are, uh, I'm summarizing. My thinking as far as tools go is that the software landscape changes every time. It's ever changing. But it's upon you to fine tune your toolkit. There are times that uh, you might be comfortable with a certain toolkit until it is rendered obsolete. I would advise that be open, look at, uh, I, I follow, that, yeah, there's one particular organization that I follow as far as Python. Python projects go, and that is Mozilla. Mozilla have really big projects written in Python, and you that's one way of just being abreast with what, what people are using out there. But uh, I would advise at least fine tune, be open, figure out what people are using out there, and if you see a gap, feel free to create a package or a tool. I've shared a number of them myself, and I wouldn't consider myself the, uh, yeah, they are definitely much more, uh, yeah, much better programmers, our, our ministers, and we can all be having or maintaining projects out there that we can use and be, and also collaborating one another. In terms of even hackathons, it can just, uh, not hackathons, Hacktoberfest, we can basically be committing to one each other's repos and uh, there you have it. So 
if you want to reach out to me, uh, that's the handle I use for most of social so media. For pretty much, yeah, for most of the things online that are official. In case something is not official, then you see me using a different one. But yes, reach out to me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and the, and, the, and the like. And last but not least, thank you. Thank you very much for being here. I appreciate you being really good audiences and uh, giving the conversation. So any questions while we wrap it up? Any questions? Anyone who has a tool that they really think we need to know about? Is that tool maybe it's a game changer as far as your workflow goes? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. um, what are the trade-offs between use systems and sorry, between you know, and virtual and proper? Ah uh, yes, yes we did go through that. Uh, huh. Where do you start? Let's see. Uh, I think a moment, really quick. Yes. So here we are. Like this is virtual and proper, right? And that's an upper on top of virtual and. But we have big end here, and I believe this is how we get into the shell, right? No, into the virtual environment, correct? So, hmm, there's a typo here. Somebody can feel free to push, push, <laughs> <laughs> yes, to push up here and there. <laughs> well, in my view, I, I prefer virtual end. I've just become comfortable using it for, for the longest while. But I know the creators of Pippen uh, were borrowing a number of things from uh, JavaScript, like the pip lock from package, the JSON doc, is it? I keep on forgetting this. It's pa package lock the JSON, right? Yes, yeah, so I, uh, another thing that uh, at least I've read up but I've not used it in production yet is that the pip lock helps in terms of. Uh, one, if you're publishing a package, a Python package, it, it really, it's, it's very specific on the versions of the supporting, supporting packages. So if you're using Django, the number of other packages that are installed within Django, yes, uh, that's what I've had. But I've not done it in the wild myself. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Or, or virtual land is the requirements for PHP 5. Uh -huh. Sometimes when you uninstall packages, it really doesn't reflect the requirements for PHP 5. So is that? Yes. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're bringing up really good questions. And uh, let's see your model. Manually edit my requirements for PHP. <laughs> Same here. You, you but, manually edit your... I, I, I can't see that. Oh, I see. So funny story is, I'm so used to uh, going to the what, what, whatever drive the Android and then uh, source, source activate. I mistakenly do it when I'm drawing Android. Like run, uh, running Android, Android Studio on, on, on Linux is going to the drive and then dot slash studio dot sh. So I go go to Android Studio and I'm like so active, <laughs> so active because I'm so used to doing that on the on the on the on on, on, on a terminal with with, with virtual LAN. But that interesting. Well, uh, what I can suggest for that is that there are tools for that, and uh, this is one actually two. There is okay. So there is pip chip. And uh, there is uh, pip auto remove. So this these are pack, uh, packages that you can use. So for the pip chain one, you can see the dots are failing, the everything is failing, but it still it still works. So here is an example. Like I can just highlight this. So we have virtual end being installed. Okay, yeah, they're just creating a, a virtual environment. And then they activate it, they install pandas, Jupyter, they install that, right? 
and then if they are to size 53, you can see all that, right? They're all 44. But with 50, it just lists the two that you stored, not the rest that you stored. And in my view, that's what should go into the recovery of the JSC, not all the rest. But now to answer your question on the removing, so we have PIP auto remove. So you PIP install or PIP auto remove. In this case, PIP install flask. And then if you write PIP install, PIP auto remove flask, it removes every other thing that came with flask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those are two that you can use uh, and hopefully they are useful. Yeah. But I think your question was also linking to pit lock helps with that. Or pit yeah. Any other questions, concerns? All right. Well, uh, I was supposed to ask this initially, but uh, it, it makes sense to ask right now. But uh, if, yeah, I just wanted to get a feel of the room before we close, and that is how many have not written Python, line of Python ever? It's okay. It, it makes sense to be here, okay? How many have written Python for less than a year? Ah, interesting, okay? How many have written Python for, let's call it two to, two to four years, two to four years? Okay, how many have written Python to five plus years? Interesting, well, uh, just judging by the one who, yeah, from the novice to somehow expert, I think we've all at least gained something by the end of this, right? So thanks again. Uh, over to who? Yeah, over to